in the great American Southwest. I bid you all good evening or good morning, as the case may be, across this great land and beyond. From the Tahitian and Hawaiian Island chains eastward across flyover country to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, south into South America, north all the way to the pole, and worldwide on the Internet, this is Coast to Coast AM, and I'm Art Bell. Good morning. You are about to meet one of the most powerful men on the face of the earth. And I'm certain he would not describe himself that way. I have done so. And you will be aware of that as you listen. He is Father Malachi Martin. He was in the Vatican. Father Martin advised two popes. Father Martin has done exorcisms for 30 years. 30 years. And so we will talk of uh, exorcism. We will talk of the Vatican and the Catholic Church. And I think you will find it beyond riveting. Stay tuned. Coming up. I've got a couple of uh, very quick announcements uh, to make. One is... We have what I consider to be one of the most stunning photographs ever taken. I can't tell you it's real, but um, I have examined it uh, carefully. And my considered opinion is that it probably is. Many of you know we have done many shows on the Philadelphia Experiment. Well, guess what, uh, ladies and gentlemen? We were just sent about 30 minutes prior to airtime, as usual, Keith will tell you. A picture of what we believe, a photograph of what we believe, is the first Philadelphia experiment, not on the Eldridge, but on the first ship in 1913. The photograph is quite clear, quite graphic, and frankly, absolutely incredible. Showing this ship uh, about half visible. Well, you go take a look for yourself. It is astounding. Absolutely astounding. And everybody I've shown it to in the short time that I've had it has repeated the same thing. And I want to thank uh, P.J. McCartney for sending it, whoever P.J. McCartney is. It's on our website right now at www.artbell.com www.artbell.com and I would appreciate comments on this incredible, incredible photograph. If you're over 40 and want to feel like, well, say you're 20 again, item, I would like to express my um, gratitude to all of you who have stood by me in this last week and a half, this odyssey, since the horrible tragedy in um, San Diego. And I would like to thank those journalists who did bother to try and get to the truth uh, with regard to uh, what occurred in San Diego and for how long it has been going on and what the motivations were behind it. But particularly to all of you, those of you who have uh, uh, stood by me during this very difficult time, and it has been a very difficult time, I would say that uh, these tests uh, are bound to come along in life occasionally. Uh, and they are, I believe, tests. So thank you. Thank you all. The dark shadows of skyscrapers are falling across New York as an elderly white-haired priest leaves the reassuring comfort of his home, heads through the streets toward the apartment block where the others are waiting, walks quite slowly carrying a small black case filled with the essential paraphernalia, of the ritual he is about to perform. The room has been prepared to his precise instructions. Clean, sprinkled with holy water, stripped of movable objects, of those now gathered inside only the priest, his face drawn and solemn, has any idea what to expect, or rather who to expect. After 30 years, as an exorcist, Father Malachi Martin has learned to recognize the nature of the demons he pursues. 
They may be ingenious or stupid, coarse or charming, brazen or craven. Hell, it seems, is no place for stereotypes. I need to know who they are, their names, and their stories. Father Martin is Irish-born. Father Martin was in the Vatican, advised to popes, and I would like to let him tell you about himself. Father Martin, uh, welcome to the program. It's an honor to have you. Good morning, Art. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know that uh, I feel very privileged to be speaking to your audience, because it's a special audience. You, uh, you're you in Manhattan? You live in Manhattan? That's right, I do, in the middle of Upper, B, Upper East Side. Um, have you lived there all your life, Father? Yes, I have. I came over here in January 1965, and I've lived on the Upper East Side ever since then. At the present moment, it's clothes in darkness, quiet. <laughs> it's a mild atmosphere. It's been a lovely spring day, really. And um, everything is quiet. There are no sirens. Everything is in peace, seemingly. In peace. Um, maybe those are the moments to watch out for, <laughs> when everything is seemingly in peace. Uh, the uh, the old expression of the calm before the storm, who knows? Yes, and uh, besides that, it's... Uh, is the general public peace very well kept from the point of view of police work and very uh, clean enough for, for a city that's reputable as dirty. Go straight on. But there are rooms and halls and Keep basement right, chapels and then turn right and small little dark corners where turn human right. agonies are lived out. Father, why would you choose to live in such a big, bustling, dirty, difficult city when you could have at any time in your adult life gone to a, a soft midwestern town uh, where things are uh, moving a little slower. That was I tempted not. I was going to live in Cincinnati. I was going to live in North Carolina. I was going to go to Santa Fe, that beautiful city. Uh, I was going to go to Texas. I was on a time. I was planning to migrate to uh, some place like uh, Southern California. But every time that there were plans even remotely forming in that regard, um, it became imperative that I stay just for another short time. I'm still saying staying for another short time. Uh, so, uh, my, life, my life is being governed by events, and I regard events as created by God's Father. So it may turn out that you will be there for f forever. Uh, it may turn out, you're quite right. At least the physical forever. Father, would you move just away away from your phone a little bit? I'm talking my beat, probably. Yes, you are, and, and that's much better. Good. That's, um, could, do not hesitate to correct me out. Oh uh, no, that's much better, okay. Father. Um, Father, if you wouldn't mind. Yes. Um, Describe a little bit of your history. I, I, I obviously you've been doing exorcisms for 30 years. I know you've advised two popes, yeah. but your history in the church generally. Well, my history in the church generally was that I, I became at 18. I entered a, Jesu a religious order called the Jesuits in Ireland. The war had just broken out on the 8th of September 1939, and um, I went for the basic training of two years. And believe you me, it was a basic training. They shaved your head and took away your nice clean clothes and gave you old patched clean clothes and took away your bill cream and your eau de cologne. And they put you to bed at about a quarter to ten and got you up at a quarter to five and fed you like a gamecock. And you didn't study one book for two years. They concentrated on training your will and analyzing it. And they cut your will down this. They, they dissected it into its component parts and examined it and found out if they could live with it and could you conform yes. to the rules and if so then they sort of fused those parts together with an ideology and then shot you out like a missile to study and to labor and to work. Father, uh, that's very interesting. What you have just described uh, I'm sure is uh, uh, was even tougher than certainly what I went through. I was in the Air Force and I went wow. through basic training at Blackwood. Uh -huh. And their job was to almost try and break you 
uh, keep right. Maybe that's the wrong and way to put it. In other right. words, yeah. they would instill in you discipline, and if you could not conform, you were out of there. You had to go. Turn I know. Right. It's the same. It was the same thing, basically, in basic training. For instance, the first job I had. Uh, it was always physical labor with an amount of spiritual reading and contemplation. The first physical job I had, I was cleaning 300 glasses, tumblers, you know, for drinking sure. uh, water. Sure. And uh, have you ever tried to clean 300 glasses by hand? No dishwasher. This is all done by hand. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that labor, uh, it was a labor, the, a young novice like me, but a second year man, came in and said, Brother Man, you need it outside in the garden. So, beautifully, I went outside in the garden and I was given a hoe. And the paths were grown with moss. And I was uh, ordered to clean the path. And in the middle of that, uh, Brother Walsh, the master of works, the other novice, came and said, uh, Brother Martin, what are you doing here? I said, I'm hoeing the moss. He said, didn't I tell you Keep to clean the grass this morning? I got my first reaction was, yes, but yes, I have a mistake. Yes. Because they wanted to get you to the point that they said, jump out that window. You didn't say how high it was. You jumped. You just jumped. Uh, and it was it a form of breaking? It was a form of getting you to abdicate your own will once you accept the condition and do what you were told. Or even mind control. It's a strong phrase, but that's really what it is. Yes, it is. And it was really, they were training your will. The mind, they left the mind almost go fallow. You never studied for two years. Having studied intensively when I was 18 to get all my exams and matriculation and studying Hebrew and Greek and math and geography and math and physics and logic and history and geography and the whole gamut of things we used to learn in school those days, they let everything go fallow. You read spiritual books, yes, but no, you learned nothing. Uh, intellectual. So they let the mind go through? Yes, but the mind was working all the time. The mind was working all the time. You were pr uh, appraising and appreciating and accepting the ideology, the outlook. The result was when after two years they gave you your first vows, poverty, celibacy, and obedience, you were rearing to go. Rearing to go. I remember the first night the night before we took those final, the first vows, I couldn't sleep with excitement. I heard that clock in the hall downstairs tolling a quarter of an hour and a half hours and hours. Any doubts? None. None? Never. Never. Not a doubt. A great joy, great enthusiasm, a great happiness, and greater, a great thought that back, as the French say, a great, let me get at it, let me do my work, let me, let me go, let me work. So by that time, you knew that you could, you absolutely knew that you could um, devote your entire life as you were about to vow to do. That's right. That's right. And they, they bred into you something else, which only started then, and it took years to achieve. And we used to call it indifference. It meant this, that, uh, all right, we all have inclination, sensual and sexual and intellectual and social, we're attracted by this and repelled by that. But you must cultivate to the point that you are not attracted in such a way that it commands your attention and your devotion. You must be indifferent. And sure, if you lose your parents in, in, in death, everybody is sorrow, sorry and so are you. But it does not destroy your devotion. It does not stop you working. You get up in the morning, you have a bad headache, you still go to work. Uh, you see a very beautiful woman, you acknowledge her beauty, but you're not attracted to it less seriously, or, or merely with desire to be with her. And similarly with food and drink, and everything pleasant and nice was to be used with that indifference, that uh, you're not finally under the control of anything that attracts the senses or the mind. Well, that, that's, I, 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 I'm sorry, um, I'm not big enough, I guess. I can't even conceive of that. How one can get to the point where one can look at a beautiful woman and not, uh, as a man, as, as, a, as a man, a human, be affected. Uh, or oh, be affected, yes. But not to start to the extent of uh, chasing after it, going after it, or wanting to uh, form an alliance of marriage, or whatever. No, no, be, be attractive. You can't kill the natural tendency. 
but uh, you were taught to be indifferent to it, that it did not command your loyalty. And all that you did for the love of God, kind of motivation. Um, how does a young Jesuit get from that point to the Vatican? I mean, what kind of road is that? The road in my case, I'm sure it varies with every individual, but the road in my case was simply that at a certain age of 21, 21 and a half, my superior said, we want you to train in Semitic languages because those are the languages in which the Bible was written, mainly Hebrew and Aramaic. Sure. But there are other allied languages that are useful, like Pharaonic Egyptian and Syriac and uh, South Semitic and Arabic, etc., and uh, Abyssinian or Ethiopian, as we used to call it then. So they sent me to university, and I studied it for four years. And at the end of that, they said, all right, now you must study philosophy. So then they sent me to a school of philosophy for three years, and it was nothing but rational philosophy, period. And after that, they said, well, now we want to, want to find out, can you teach? So they sent me teaching little boys French and Greek, little boys at the ages of 12 and 14, for three years. And then they said, okay, now you must do theology. So they gave me four years of theology in Belgium, uh, where there was nothing but theology, morning, noon, and night, in an international house. And then they said after that, okay, now you must get a doctorate in Semitic languages, Oriental art, and history. And then they gave me four years of that. And at that point, then they said, all right, you are now posted to the Vatican to teach there as a philosopher. Well, Father, Father, were you at some point, I mean, obviously, uh, there are so many Jesuits, and somebody at some point must have looked at you or put their hand on you and said, you have a special path to follow, even within the church, and, and started you down that particular path. Yes. You see, every month in the old system, changed now the Jesuits, but in the old system, every month the superior, the local superior, sent in a speculum. What they call a speculum. A speculum is an app from mirror. It's a report on Brother X, Brother Martin, Brother Kelly, Brother Keep whoever he is, each one. And those are put together according as you advance, year after year, within the order. And at the end of it all, they call you in and say, listen, this is what people have been saying about you all along. The, the decisions in your regard were made on account of these Keep facts, and they were account of what every superior had said about you. And it's that accumulation of facts and a profile, what we now call a profile, we didn't call it a profile then, we call it a speculum, a mirror of the man. Uh, it, that is what inclines them to mark you out as useful. And of course, their, their use of you was always made in view of your talent. There were some men with me who were brilliant mathematicians but couldn't say bonjour. They couldn't learn a language. Yes. Uh, so they, they graded you according to your talent. And um, they found I had a, a capacious memory. I was hardly the hair. No problems with health ever. I could sleep on the floor. I could labor all day. I could live a little sleep. I didn't require much more than the normal intake of food. And I was dead keen on my work. And they could use those talents. Keep but somebody had to see that. Oh, oh. Yes, they did. And a very early superior thought and wrote to Rome about it, to my, the major superior in Rome. I see. And they made that decision which passed down the line. In those days, Art, it's not the same today. In those days, there was one central hub in the Roman Catholic Church, the of the Vatican. And out of it, picturesquely, you can see it in your imagination, there ran pipes load uh, to everywhere. Father, hold on. Sure. We'll be right back to you. We're at the bottom of the hour. My guest is Father Malachi Martin from the high desert. You're listening to the CBC Radio Network. Finding a new route. Free. West of the Rockies at 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 
800-825-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. 1-800-825-5033. This is the CBC Radio Network. From Manhattan, New York, my guest. My guest is the exorcist, Father Malachi Martin. Yes, you'll hear about it. I will warn you, though, um, what you will hear tonight may actually not be suitable for all audiences. And so, exercise parental control, because some of this can get pretty rough. Now, listen here. The best radio in the entire world, portable radio, is, without argument, the ATS-909 by Sanji. And I have all the best radios in the world here because I collect them. I love them. Radio, radio has been my life, actually. And um, it is a truly remarkable radio. Uh, it's the latest, the greatest. World Radio TV Handbook gave it a five-star rating. I give it as many stars as you can imagine. There's nothing that beats it. I've got the Sony 2010, the Grundig Satellite 700. Um, Nothing beats it, period. Eight inches long, five inches high, so it packs easily. Uh, four AA batteries will run it. 40 hertz resolution in sideband, specific upper and lower filtering for sideband. Continuous coverage, of course, from long wave down below broadcast to 30 megahertz. The audio is exquisite. Uh, it's finely crafted. Sensitivity, selectivity are all you could ask for without overload. This is the best portable radio in the world. By the way, when you buy it, uh, you get the 500-page 1997 Passport to World Band Radio, uh, the TV guide, in essence, for World Band listening, normally $20. The price on the 909 is $289.95, $289.95 worth every penny. You can buy one on Saturday morning. At 9 o'clock, or Monday morning at 7.30, at 1-800-522-8863. That's 1-800-522-8863. The Sea Crane Company, they're the ones that sell the best. Are you making too many trips to the bathroom at night? Loss of sex drive? That's it. You get your money back. The number is 1-800-249-6060. That's 1-800-249-6060. Back now, ba uh, back now to Father Malachi Martin. Uh, Father, are you uh, there? Of course. Okay. I'm listening fastly because I find the, what you advertise is absolutely interesting. Well, it is. Um, I, I, I don't know that it would all apply, for example, to Father Malachi Martin's case, but... Yeah. Keep right, and then exit right. It tells me how the other half lived, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, exit well, right. To yes, it is. Um, uh, Father. Yes. Well, I guess we're, we're trying an experiment here, Turn folks. Left. We've got a kind of a little thing over the telephone, trying to uh, eliminate the pops and the peas and so forth, but it seems to be moving around. So. How is it doing now? Now it's okay. As long as it's not moving around, it's fine. All right. All right. Keep I, after me. I think we're all right. Father, how old are you now? I am 76. 76? Yes. Get ready to turn right. How much longer are you going to continue to actively do what you do? As long as the good turn Lord gives right. me the strength and there's work to be done and people to be helped and people to be counseled and consoled and strengthened. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, the, the particular avocation that I follow, uh, the need for ministration in these matters has only increased. For instance, I've been working in the field Get of ready. Turn in left. the northeast corner since, uh, since 1970. Turn left. I came over in 1965, but by 1970 I was hard at work. Uh, these occurrences and happenings people needing uh, help, needing administration, counseling, needing exorcism, uh, the number, see, the mere numbers alone, the 
number has increased by about 800 percent. About 800 percent. In what period of time, Father? Since 1970. Since 1970. 800 percent. 800 percent. And then we have new phenomena that we never met that time. For instance, we now have a series of 20-somethings and 30-somethings, mainly men, but some women, but mainly young men, successful men in brokerage, in medicine, in science, in architecture, in politics, who come and say, look, Father, I want to such and such a thing. I want to a job. I want a salary. I want a position at this university. I want that lady, that woman. And I, I finally, in my desperation, I made a pact with the devil, and I got what I wanted, but now he won't let me go. Please help me. Keep right, we never and then that turn before. right. That's a very new phenomenon. And they're all 20-somethings and 30-somethings. Well, maybe we so in other words, Turn right. put simply, we've got a lot more people making bad deals. <laughs> That's right. Or put, uh, you know, from the half full, half empty image, uh, we've got a very, very active uh, Lucifer and Satan, because they are distinct demons, by the way. But uh, that's something else to another story completely, but we have a very, very active, uh, uh, di demonic presence in our presence in the present configuration of American society. All right. I'm only speaking about America, although I'm told, for instance, that there are eight active exorcists working in Rome and Milan, because Milan, Turin, and Rome are afflicted with an awful lot of possessed people and exorcisable people. Um, all right, let's go back to basics. Please, 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 uh, somebody says, ask uh, uh, Father Martin, if the Keep Exorcist right. movie is not, in fact, based on incidents that occurred at St. Louis University, a Jesuit school in the early 70s, I'm a graduate of that school, and the folklore has it that there is an abandoned room at the top, at the top of Duborg Hall, which was Turn the site left. of an exorcism which ultimately culminated at St. Francis Xavier Church, Georgetown U, U the home of the protagonist from The Exorcist, also happens to be a Jesuit school. Please ask him if there is any tie-in and if he has seen the room at Borough Hall at SLU. Yes, uh, you're asking me that? Yes, sir. Yes, I have. And it did occur there. In fact, that exorcism was the landmark uh, exorcism in America. And it's been published in a, in a repertorial form by a man called Thomas Allen, uh, published by Doubleday a couple of years ago. And it's a harrowing Keep right, story. And then it's turn a right. Story because for, I think for two years yes. are over. These two turn right. priests, unknown to their confrères, their brethren in the same house, had to pursue this, this, this gruesome and awesome task of liberating right. a young man who was liberated completely. Here we are. Safe and, and uh, safe. They, 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 their brethren, their, their colleagues, never knew anything about it. They just knew these.